Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's seminar, which is the topic Switching from GCC to NEC4 in Public Building Works Benefit and Obstacles. And I'm Eric Dane, uh, the moderator of today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar is co organized by CIC, School of Professional Construction, uh, School, of, School of Professional Department in Construction. NEC Asia Pacific and HKIS. And before the commencing of the seminar, there is some rules which we would like to remind everyone. First of all, the CPD certificate. Since this event counts for 1.5 CPD hours, uh, registrants opting for CPD e certificate of attendance are required to leave. Uh, the full English name and email address with an asterisk as a separator in between. And you can see on the screen there is a, a highlight in green color. This is the example. And you have to leave your full English name in the Q&A chat box during the seminar. The e-certificate will only be sent to uh, registrants who have left their English name and email in the Q&A. So this is a very important reminder for those who would like to get an e-certificate. And all personal data provided in the Q&A chat box will be built and used by the staff who are involved in processing of the e-certificate. And some more, some more information. Uh, there will be a Q&A session for this seminar and you are welcome to leave your questions in the Q&A chat box during the seminar. And the organizer owns the copyright for the content present in the seminar. The seminar must, under no circumstances, be recorded and republished in any way without the prior consent of the organizer. And for your information, the seminar includes features that are now audio, video, and any documents and other materials exchanged or viewed during the session to be recorded. By joining this seminar, the participants automatically consent to such recording of the materials that are shared on the webinar platform. So the above are the housekeeping rules, and I hope to, uh, you can fully understand. And now, here is the rundown of tonight. Uh, after the in brief introductions of tonight's two speakers, and the first part of the seminar will be begin by uh, Mr. Robert Jarrett, and the second part will be carried out by Sir Sophia Van Ho Yi. And then we will have a panel discussion, which the questions you have uh, entered in the Q&A chat box will be answered in this session. So let's uh, introduce our first speakers. Mr. Robert Jarrett is a senior NEC consultant and NEC users group secretary. She has over 35, exper 35 years experience in setting up and managing contracts with 25 of those using NEC. She is currently based in Hong Kong and she has been NEC user group secretary since 2006. Uh, she has a number of publications and including NEC3 and NEC4 compare, NEC2 and NEC3 compare and some other publications which you can see on the screen. So I believe she is very experienced in NEC and you can see that he is involved in the evolution of NEC. He is also a credit mediator and dispute resolution advisor. And our second speaker is Surveyor Van Ho Yi. He is a professional quantity surveyor with around 30 years of experience. He is specialized in providing contractual advice to various contract forms, including NEC. She has been involved in government NEC projects from DSD, CEDD, WSD, Highway Department, and EMSD. So you can see almost all the government departments uh, uh, with NEC projects he has been involved. And he, is, he acts as an NEC advisor for free government projects, providing practical advice on application of NEC. He has also been involved in implementation of NEC for various projects for agility and progress and uh, other projects. So I'm sure tonight both speakers will share their experience 
about using the NEC and their benefit and obstacles. Oh, and without further delay, may I invite uh, the first speaker of tonight, uh, Robert, to come to, to have a share. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Okay, good evening, all. I'll take my mask off if I might have my two injections. Relatively safe. 35 years, feels like 35,000 years experience, especially on a Friday night. Who organised this for 7 o'clock on a Friday night? Lots of people here want to go home. Okay, so what are we talking about? Uh, so, so I get the chance to focus on what well, I think are the benefits of using NEC. Um, but, but I'd like to be realistic and say that there are perhaps a, a, in, in some of these um, some of these areas some new skill sets that people I think are re required to required to get in order to get the best out of themselves and the best out of the contract. Um, though I'm actually a member of uh, HKIS, I'm a fellow of uh, the RSCS. Um, I, I would like to think that these skill sets are in keeping with the modern day surveyor that HKIS. Uh, would, would encourage. So I would like to think these, the, the, the benefits, the skill sets would be you know, um, uh, very much in line with the modern surveyor that HKIS would like to uh, would like to see in industry. So I'm going to look at these. I'm going to read them out. I'm going to look at these um, the, these benefits. Well, I, well, I believe the benefits of using NEC. I, I don't think it's the biggest change imaginable from GCC to NEC. Don't fear it. You know, it's it's. It's not the greatest step imaginable. It's just a more modern day contract management style than that which we have with GCC. Now, in fairness to GCC, its roots are, you know, probably the mid 1940s. Uh, GCC, I, I believe, was derived from the ICE conditions contract all the way back to the late 40s, 1950s. So, you know, it stood its time quite well, but we've moved on, haven't we? Society is a very different place these days. So let's have a look at some of these aspects. Um, so benefits, all about benefits, isn't it? But what I would like to see as an industry is we focus on producing uh, high quality tender documents. Um, I have to say, I, I reviewed quite a lot of tender documents I have in my time, and I would say most of them are poor, very poor. <laughs> not, not very good at all, sets of, uh, you know, uh, tender documents at certainly main contractor level. And what I've seen, uh, if you take a look below the main contract itself, have a look at the subcontract, even worse. So contractors tend to pick up a really bad tender document to make it even worse to turn it into a subcontract. Not good enough. I don't think it's good enough at all. So we, we need to have a much greater sense of professional pride in the documents that we're preparing. Uh, we need to be better listeners, listen to our clients. Constructive, constructively discuss with our clients what they can and cannot have. Set about writing, writing documents using uh, plain English. Make it clear, coherent, consistent, uh, without ambiguity or inconsistency. So, what do NEC contracts bring to the table? Well, we we don't we don't tell you how to prepare a tenant document as such. We're not that mandating that, but we do have some really good templates for preparing a high quality scope. And a high quality sort of contract data. The contract data, think of that as being sort of recitals, the appendix to the form of tender with other, other forms of contract. So I think we put some really good templates in place and through the guidance notes, uh, it encourage you how to complete them comprehensively. So, so my, my plea would be uh, use them, use them, look at the guidance, understand how to fill in the scope, understand how to fill in the contract data. So the right prompts, the right questions are all uh, found within these templates. So do have a look, you know, there are different contracts, but have a look at the NEC4 engineering and construction contract user guide volume two. Not very really snappy titles, are they? But that document is, uh, shows a really good scope template with prompts. And we need to produce uh, much better um, tender documents. So do we need some new skill sets for this? Well, how many of us can write in plain English. I cannot, so I am English, but can I write in plain English? No, I cannot. So um, I, I have a certain skill, I think. I think it's a skill. I can review your tender document and tell you how bad it is. Can I write it really well in the first place? Uh, I don't think I can, no. So 
But we need to learn that skill, surely. We need to we need to use the uh, the, the most you know, clearest words you might imagine. Most clearest, I would probably be told that is not plain English. You can see my problems, can't you? So, you know, learn how to use plain English. Uh, fill yourself full of pride. You know, um, produce that that fantastic tender buckle that you are that you are actually proud of. I, I would actually do away with Q. I see QA forms prepared by, reviewed by, approved by. I don't I don't believe in that approach. So, the approach I would take is that I am freshly proud of this tender document. If you cannot sign up to that, it doesn't go out the door. You know, so step up in terms of professionalism. Produce those high quality tender documents. Okay, if it takes an extra week, it takes an extra week. An extra re week to move from poor to you know high quality tender documents will be worth its weight in gold. So I think a benefit then you see should be that you get more predictable outcomes. So what, what do you want outcomes of? Well, outcomes in terms of time, cost, quality, safety, and, and other things. Now, what I believe you get with NEC contracts is more and better quality management information throughout the management of the contract itself. So we have up-to-date, realistic programs in place, the contractor's best and honest intentions. We have a robust approach to change management in uh, conversation and process. We have uh, honesty in good time through the early warning process of things that could uh, threaten the project in terms of time, cost and quality. We have for certain, so that says main options, that's a spelling set for me, main options. Certain main options, we have a, a regular requirement to uh, report a forecast of defined costs for the whole of the works. And we have through X12 and X20 any key performance indicators, reports from the contractor on whether or not they believe they will hit the target, and if they don't, what they will do about hitting that target. Okay, but all this good high quality management information is coming through, but you have to be intelligent in what you do with it. So what can you do? If the program is not good, if there's massive conversation events that you're not dealing with, early warnings you're ignoring, Forecast of defined costs that you are ignoring. If you're basically sticking your head in the bucket of sand and doing nothing, then you know the project will have problems. So that NEC contracts aren't fixing these problems for you. If your program is, is problematic, if planned completion is starting to creak and go past the completion date, if early warnings, lots of issues that are coming to the fore, then then we have problems, don't we? And we, we need to uh, upskill to deal with all of these things, all of this management information that is coming our way to NEC contracts. So uh, my opinion is you're as good as your scope. Go back to the last slide. We need to produce uh, very good scopes. Now I've seen lump sum contracts that are basically doubled in value, NEC as well as GCC. Now why, do, why is that? Because we get the starting point wrong. The scope is not good enough to begin with. Um, our program will represent the original scope. Uh, you know, so if we if we double our scope, we will double the program, you know, double the cost, double everything. So we need that really good starting point, which is the scope. Other tools that I think we need to think about, even in the world of NEC, maybe they should introduce this in future, you know, future amendments or future issues. Things like earned value analysis or trending. I can't actually see the bottom of that. Exercise. Forgive me. All of the above. New skill set is all of the above. So I think, I think we need, you need to be honest. So all those people sitting from HKIS, all those charter surveyors amongst you, how good are you at programming? How good are you at negotiating conversations, in, uh, negotiating quotations and conversations? How good are you with asking the right questions at early warning meetings, of, of uh, reporting or reviewing the forecast of defined cost, of setting, monitoring, review KPIs, all these things, you know, earn value analysis. If you're not good at doing those things, acquire that new skill set. Not that difficult. The, the difficulty, I think you pass the difficulty test in getting chartered. Getting chartered is incredibly difficult. You have to make so much commitment, so much study, so much sacrifice. You've demonstrated you have a level of, of, uh, of expertise and intelligence. Now go and learn some new skills. Learn those new skills to help you manage contracts to create great outcomes. We need a buildup of trust in our industry. We are an industry, if you, if you 
reflect upon us. We are fragmented. It is hard work, isn't it? We have pretty low productivity for that, which I can, you know, I can glean, glean. Very poor cash flow. Most consultants will say they have a poor cash flow, let alone contractors or subcontractors. We are generally a non-trusting industry with poor profitability. So surely, you know, all of that has to perhaps has to do with the past, um, how our industry was, was set up. I uh, read a book once about the industry, certainly from uh, uh, from the UK, being set up based upon the social class system of, uh, of the UK. Pretty boring book, uh, apologies to the author, but quite indicative of how our industry was was created. But what the past is the past, isn't it? Can't do anything about the past. We have, I think, we have an exciting future in our industry. Some incredible technology coming through. Some incredibly bright people, some fantastic universities. So, you know, learn from the past, but in a way, sort of forget the past. Let's create an amazing future in this industry. Let, let us create, um, you know, one of the world's best industries that, that where we have graduates queuing up to join our industry. And NEC is one of those, I think, fantastic tools or products that helps people enjoy our industry. So be ethical. It's a chance of today. You need to be ethical. You need to be honest. You need to act with integrity. You need to do your professional best at all time. Uh, what you may need to do, so I, I think a lot of NEC is about having a different and or the right attitude and mindset. Uh, if you don't, if you think you've got a cross wire in here, then get yourself rewired. Get some behavioral training. Understand that I'm not saying you should trust people automatically, but you should always be telling the truth. Always tell the truth and trust levels will emerge from that. If you think you need to get some behavioural training, get some behavioural training. Don't think that everybody is out, is out all of the time to, to turn you over in some way, to extract more time or money from you than they are due. You know, you know most, most people are good people, trying to do an honest day's work uh, and work as well or as hard as they can. I just find that some of our efforts, some of our uh, things that we do, are non-value adding. So let, let's let's get rid of the waste in our industry. Let's have a really, you know, uh, let's work less hours. Let's, as we were saying earlier, let's work less hours. Let's do more value adding work in our industry. So a new skill set. I've said to be truly ethical. So I didn't want to say to be ethical because, of course, you, you should be ethical when you get chartered. But but actually, just realise the importance of your chartership and the importance of being, well, what I'm saying, truly eth ethical. And attend to those soft skills. If you're not a good listener, if you're not a good presenter, uh, you know, the first time I did a presentation, I wanted the, the ground to open up and swallow me whole. Uh, that I remember, it was at the Institution of Civil, Eng Civil Engineers, 300 people in the room, stacked up high. That was my first public speaking. I literally, I, I, I could throw my heart pounding out of my chest. Those of you that hate Presenting, you know, then then try and attend to that. Get get some confidence in, in the ability to to do public speaking. Speaking at these webinars, come and join us on the next set. Uh, we will help you. So attend to those soft skills. Improve your 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 confidence. You know, ad address all those matters that, that that concern you. Be honest. Tell people. Tell people of, of your reservations. So the positive change of, of behaviour. So what, what, I, what I read is that no is a word that we are comfortable with, that our brain is okay when we use the word no, but our brain is not okay when we use the word yes. Um, so learn how to say yes, okay, yes and no, but don't compromise your professionalism. Become that good listener. How does NEC help you with all of this? I think the, you know, the, the communication process, the early warning process, the, uh, you know, the, the, the process is to demand the use of the word yes or the word no and justify the word no uh, where, where you need to. Become that good listener, engage with, with each other. Nothing wrong with criticism, just make it constructive. I, I was speaking today at a training course about how we're, we're well versed, aren't we, learning about the law, you know, and we're well versed at learning about pricing documents and methods and measurements, all those exciting things. What we're not very good at is producing the most brilliant program and a brilliant scope. What we need to do is to look at those two documents at the same time and remove the waste. Get rid of the parts of the scope in the program that perhaps lead to unsafe working or 
uh, inefficient working or uh, unproductive working, you know, be mindful that you can change the program and change the scope. Okay, where we want the contractor to be ultimately is having an extremely safe site where everybody is working as productively, as efficiently, and, and as you know as, as well and happily as they can do. So good, good, con positive, constructive criticism. Well, it's not in itself criticism. We need to find a better word than that. It's challenge, isn't it? Challenge things. Challenge each other. Challenge yourself. You know, don't accept usual outcomes. Don't accept the norm. You know, strive for something better. So have an opinion. I was I was told recently that after all of your education, all of your training, to have no opinion in your subject matter is frankly a waste of your time. What have you been doing if you haven't got an opinion? If you're in a meeting, have an opinion. How that, however, too many meetings are full of too many people. We need to be leaner in the people in our, in our meetings. And when you're invited to a meeting, it's because you must have some subject matter expertise have that opinion. Ethics again, so the positive change of behaviour behavior that I think you get with NC contracts comes all the way back to ethics. Apologies, I need to look again. So new skill set, acquire the right soft skills. I don't think it's, it's a dramatic change here. A lot of it's about soft skills. So I think using NEC, if you, if you, if you understand what I'm saying here, so NEC is a really sensible, understandable, simple set of contract management requirements. But do we have the soft skills uh, to actually to actually get the best out of each other and understand the contract? So I think NEC, what it does, it focuses on us doing more of the right things. You know, I do not like those contracts that say, contractor says, oh, there's a problem here with ground conditions. And the contract says, write me a full report and tell me what you're going to do to fix all those problems. What a load of rubbish. That's utterly outdated, isn't it? So we're a team, aren't we? So use the word team, to, uh, we. Stop using the words like I and you. Stop doing the finger wagging. Stop looking at blame. Start looking at, at solving problems. Use each other's skills. So, you know, some things that I've seen in the past, exploitation of another party's misfortune. That's got to be immoral, you know, possibly legal, but certainly immoral. That, that is quite wrong. So when you find the other party is having problems, work with them to, to fix those problems. You know, identify them, fix them. I'm not saying here the client should be standing there with money, handing dollars out to, to bail the contractor out. I'm saying use your intelligence. Use your intelligence to work with the contractor to fix problems that come along. That's what you get in the NEC early warning process. We're keep, keeping each other informed through the program or early warnings. Um, do something that the whole idea of early warnings are that we'll, when we have a chance to fix something, do something about it. Do not wait till the, the opportunity is passed. That is why it's one. So programs are good, being described as the, uh, as the beating part of any set like that. Early warnings, the jewel in the crown, real time change management. I haven't heard of a little saying for that, but we should aspire to real-time change management. Again, HKAS surely would implore their uh, uh, their professionals to, to keep on top of change. So we get to completion and we've pretty well got the final account. Okay. So we need to strive in our industry for world-class quality outcomes. That's what we want. That's the right thing, isn't it? Quality, we, should, we shouldn't have supervisors. In my opinion, clients should not be employing supervisors to check the contractor's done the work right. The contractor should just do the work right. The contractor and their subcontractors. How do we get to world-class quality industry? Maybe the future is the combination of BIM and off-site manufacture. Maybe that gets us the quality that we need. We need world-class accountancy. We're moving as an industry from a uh, price-based industry to a cost-based industry. So how good are we at records and understanding the records and accountancy and, and mapping costs to things like the schedule of cost components in NEC. Let's have some world class organisations making you know, profitable, plowing that profit back into their organisation, uh, helping charities. Let's have some fantastic organisations in our industry. And apologies, new skill set. You can do all of this. You know. Any one of these things you can't do, I, I don't believe you. You can achieve all of those things that I've said in that slide if you put your mind to it. If you want to achieve it, they're all 
all within your grasp. No excuses. So focus on improvement. So what, what is improvement? This is almost a bit of a highlight, really. So produce some better scopes, better, better tender documents. Improve your own, say, personality. Is personality the right word? Your own skill set, your own personal skill set. You know, gain some confidence. Do some public speaking. You know, the art presented. Learn how to prepare business cases. You know, learn how to properly uh, manage a risk uh, register to create the correct amount of contingency according to the risk register. Do not use 5% for building as a contingency or 10% for civils as a contingency. That is just made up nonsense. Move away from provisional sums, prime cost items. These are all things of the past. Okay, move into a, you know, a future uh, future based industry. More early warnings, but more relevant early warnings. Discard the ones that are ir irrelevant. View the timescales in the contract. If you have two weeks to do something, that to me is absolute worst case scenario. Beat the timescales. Well, you've got two weeks, do it in two days. Okay. In fact, even better. I, I wrote to an artist who really wants a copy. Ask me, but in our NEC newsletter, um, have a look at the website, NECcontract.com. Have a look at some of the newsletters. One, I think, was last quarter. Was about a Mark II project manager. A Mark I project manager does everything asked of them in the contract. How many of us, how many of us honestly do that? A Mark II project manager smashes all those obligations and timescales. In fact, when something is submitted, they accept it straight away. Why? Because they've had input into the preparation of that deliverable. Uh, more regular programs. Let's have better programs, more regular, with more of them being accepted. Let's encourage contractor proposals to change the scope. Ideally, if, you, if you're doing early contractor involvement, this should happen in the first stage. But if not, then encourage contractor proposals. But be quick with them. Be very quick to understand the benefits or not of a contractor proposal. Those proposals come, could come in via uh, value engineering proposals or whole life, whole life uh, benefits. Whichever it is, be as quick as you can in identifying the benefits and the acceptability of that change. Let's strive for completion. The completion that the contractor strives for on or before the completion date is just that, everything. No outstanding works, no defects, done. Fantastic job done, no defects, no outstanding works. Let us get to completion with a near final account. All of these things you can do with NEC contracts. If you apply your mind to it. New skill set, speed. speed, speed things up. Don't gamble, don't guess. Um, discard things that are less important. So try and speed up processes. Try and work with the contractor to help the contractor spend less time and therefore less money. What's it want? Of decision making. Another, another soft skill, learn the art of decision making. Quite a lot of people I know do not like to make decisions. Do not put that in the position then. Do not have them as a project manager if they do not like making decisions. Okay, so learn the art of decision making. A couple more slides I think I've done. Uh, let me tell me to speed up, so I think I'm okay. Uh, better communicating. Read, understand, apply clause 13. Learn how the contract expects you to communicate. I.e. no verbal instructions, no confirmation of verbal instructions. Despite what other people think, do not use technical queries or RFIs, request for information. You are bypassing the contract. You are acting outside of the contract. I'm not saying you're breaching the contract. You're doing something different that's not in the contract. TQs and RFIs are usually flagging up a problem. That problem should be through the early warning process. Now, I agree, we don't want to clock up the early warning process with teeny tiny little TQs and RFIs. So, we need to, I personally think, push them through the early warning process and divert them to either technical people or to the project manager. But be careful, acting outside of the contract leaves you in no man's land. If an RFI does not get answered in time, you will say, oh, that's cost me time and our money. Well, you didn't notify an early warning, I'm afraid. So you have problems if you rely upon TQs or RFIs to demonstrate some sort of contractual entitlement. These are old fashioned stuff, aren't they? CVI is old fashioned, TQs old fashioned, RFI is old fashioned. Let's move on. Let's create a much, a much better, you know, ideally cloud based communication system. Look at some of the cloud based contract management solutions out there. A number of organizations 
I'm sure would love to tell you about their fantastic pro processes and, uh, and products that will help you manage contracts better. Uh, better communicating will help us all with auditability and transparency. What have we got to hide? You know, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing highly secretive about our industry, is there? So let's have an improvement in auditability and transparency. So new skill set, learn how to write better communications. Um, I still see really uh, ambiguous or inconsistent wording of project manager instructions. So writing better communications quicker. Before you issue it to a contractor, send a draft. Are you happy with this? Is it clear what I'm asking for in the instruction? What we really, so a benefit is all about benefits. You, these are all the benefits you can derive, I think, from using NEC contracts in the way that they're intended. Uh, if you, well, you know, what I would like to do is to eradicate formal disputes. I'm really sorry to those of you who are adjudicators, arbitrators, or judges, or even mediators. I'm a mediator. I actually don't want any work as a mediator. Fantastic news. Let's get rid of formal disputes. So if you put, if you enact all of those seven slides I've just said, if you do all those things I've just said in the previous slides, I would very much doubt as an industry if we would have very many disputes at all. But we will still have a difference of opinions. That's natural. I think that's quite healthy. You think something is this, I think it's something else. That's healthy, isn't it? Nobody knows everything. So have an opinion. If your opinions match, good news. If they don't match, understand each other's position. Okay, learn how to negotiate. I had some, did a professional negotiation course recently, first time in my life. I learned such a lot. Negotiation, the, the modern way, isn't that bashing your fist down on the tray, but trying to get your own way. Learn how to professionally negotiate in the modern way. Learn the art of mediation. Apply these, the, the, these newfound skills. But if all of this fails, in NEC contracts, we have a concept called senior representatives, the first tier informal dispute resolution. Okay, now if, if, if the senior representatives, two representatives from both the contractor and the client, if they fail to solve the dispute that's in front of them, then you off you go to formal dispute resolution. And that's crazy. I, I think it's crazy. Once the dispute ran out of your hands, once the dispute lands in adjudication, arbitration, litigation, you have lost control of your own dispute. To me, that's madness, absolute madness. Why would you want to let that happen? Of course, advisors and dispute advisors want that to happen. They make good money from it. But we lose, the industry lose, you lose. You lose time, you get stressed, uh, not good. So we have to learn how to set contracts up better, manage contracts better, create better outcomes. New skill set, learn how to negotiate. Learn how to ne negotiate in a modern environment. Learn how to mediate. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <coughs> in this Robert is still about how to run the contract. It's not only applicable for using NDC, also applicable for using other of building content. And for my part, and I will mainly concentrate on the obstacles in using NDC and based on my experience in running NEC for the past, um, some people have uh, had um, some discussion about um, for the, for the, uh, when using NEC, they have some problems and, and they are and, and, uh, and therefore they are not quite, I would say they are not quite competent in using the NEC. So what well, the obstacle uh, usually in, in the user using the NEC, uh, you can see there are one with there these obstacles mainly. The first one is about the project teams do not have much experience in managing any projects using NEC. And the second obstacle is, despite they are different options under the NEC, they are using the same approach. And of course, the final is about the difference of the views between the employees and the contractors. And I will further to elaborate this point a little bit more. The first one is about the uh, uh, obstacles of using NEC is about the project team um, normally uh, they, because they do not have much experience in managing projects using NEC. So that 
they may find that, for instance, they find when it's somewhat difficult for him to, to manage. For example, um, one of the driving objectives of NEC is about the stimulus to the good management. And one thing is about the risk management. And early warning is one of one examples under the NEC that facilitate the employers and the contractors managing the risk. And what's early warning? And in a simple term, early warning is something that um, the contractors or the project managers, when they become aware in methods that can affect the time, cost, and quality, so that we need to notify each other. And then they organize an early warning meeting so that they can discuss the, the issues and try to make some proposals and, if possible, to mitigate the effect of the events. But, um, Experience doing that um, for the even for the project manager side or the contractor side, and um, they are some they are always asked: Is the early warning really helpful or useful for the project? First of all, um, the, the first concern is about the, um, the reasons for issuing early warning. And um, some contractors, because they are afraid that. that if they do not use any early warning notes, then at the time when the early warning finally turned out to be a compensation event, their assessment will be somewhat be, be prejudiced. So whenever they find that uh, there will any any event that they may consider that they, that they have some time or cost effect, they will use a early warning. Uh, say for example, um, uh, one of the uh, early warning uh, I have uh, uh, faced before is uh, a contract of the early warning saying that uh, there will be a, a risk of uh, change of the worst information during the construction. And so that at the first early warning meeting, the contractor and the project manager sit together and try to resolve how to, how to resolve the issue of how the issue of worst information um, during construction. But we all know that um, the construction is a dynamic process. This means that every, every day everything will change. And this is unavoidable that there will be changes that you know, there will cause the compensation event. So, uh, I would, so at the end of the day, both the main contractors, both the contractors and the project managers cannot come up with any solutions so that to mitigate the, the, the effect of such early warning. So what did they do? They only said that keep in view. So that at, even at the end of the project, this issue is still straight on and have no solution to solve. So that for the both side, for the manager side and the contractor side, when they want to issue some early warning, they must first of all think about where the early warning can be resolved or can be mitigated to a certain extent. And the second issue is concerns about sometimes the early warning may be too general. So that if it is not project specific something, and um, it may not be have any solution. So what can they do? They just repeat and repeat that issue. Early warning is very early and which doesn't mean things. And there's no solution at all. And the first one is about the behavior of the parties and the risk it doesn't mean things. And and what do the project managers and the contractors need to behave if they need to cooperate? Is in the fact they may need to cooperate instead of conflicting. But sometimes um, maybe um, there may be some circumstances um, that the atmosphere, that the atmosphere during the, the early one and may not be create a how to say a a cooperating atmosphere. So, and the second is about um, for early warning, and the basic requirement is to never touch on applicants. But sometimes it is unavoidable. For what that, my view is that for what that you can stick on the form of how to resolve the question, mm. you may touch on liability, you may touch on the liability issues, but the law takes much emphasis on this party to be responsible. But 
to try to sort out how to indicate or how to avoid questions. And, and the following is uh, what is the action of either this research meeting, but there is no action by others. This is another concern and that both parties find that sometimes early, uh, early morning meeting, the risk research meeting will not be helpful because at the end of the meeting, um, instead of, uh, even though the court dimension may, 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 may not done the, the mitigating action, the one no one will take it. So what do they do? They just repeat and repeat and reach subsequent and reach each other meeting. So for for the for, for how to um, uh, resolve the risk management issues, first of all about the use of the early morning meetings, both mark both both parties must learn how to first of all how to use the early morning and how to resolve them and finally it take action instead of let it drag on and and or, and repeat and repeat and that is the same And the second concern in which the contractor or the project manager uh, concerns about subcontracting. And under the NEC, um, there is a condition that uh, all subcontractors are required to be accepted by the project manager. And for the contractors, Point of view, they find that it is somewhat tedious and time consuming because you know, subcontracting is a normal circumstance under the construction ministry. But having said that, um, first of all, the contractors should be aware that um, subcontractors, the terms and the definition under the, under the NEC. So it should stop all types of subcontractors are required to be accepted. So this is if the definition of the subcontractor under the NGC so that they are required to be accepted by the project manager. And the second concern is about what if subcontractors start work but without acceptance by the project manager? And there are different um, opinions in, in this in, in theory of this issue. So they may be, some some said that it may be a defect. Some may even stop work and ask the concept and ask the contractor to submit the subcontractor information for the project manager to, to start again. And also there are some another way that they can easy. We both mean that they easy that provided that the subcontractor can provide the work in according with the contract, then this is okay. And the and the contractor is only required to provide the information later for the project manager's acceptance. And finally we drop out and you talk about another concern is uh, some contractor will ask and uh, if the subcontractor proposed has been accepted for the project manager, can it be changed? Some project managers say that no, because I already accepted. Or that then you have a strong opinion, or what that then you can you can prove that your replace your replacement subcontractor can provide better quality of work. I will not allow you to say. But is it the real um, use of hope? This is what the project needs to think about. It. Another obstacle in using NGC is um, I think that um, the maturity of projects now using NGC has um, have the same problems about the program. And as we all know, the program requirement under the NEC is much more detailed. In comparing with GCC, and under the program, they need to provide lots of information for the project manager to for, 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 the, for the acceptance. So first of all, it's a lot of difficulty in accepting the first program. And, and as an NEC advisor, I always advise the project manager and the contractor need to work together in in in, um, in preparing the first program. But normally. Normally, there is the contractor who prepared the first token and then send to the project manager for their acceptance without any communication. So that there's always a different view about the say for example the, the program presentation and um, about the, the duration of these, these activities or something. So that there will long drag on about the, the, the program. 
And second of all, the second concern is about the attitude in assessing programs. And some, some may use the provision under NEC as a checklist so that they will use it as a, as a fundamental um, criteria in assess, in, as, in accepting or, or rejecting a program. Say, for example, if a program is also in a terminal form, some project manager will, be, will, will simply reject in saying that your program is not declared in according to the scope of the information. So that, from my view, um, it should be in accepting a program, you should take a I would say you need to, you need to take an overall review. Provided the, the program can satisfy the, the program to satisfy the project manager feel that the contractor knows what he is doing and what he plans to work. And if he is spent in a logical way, then you need to accept it. But for the port, but for the project manager side, as you may see under the slide, they need to accept it. But for them, they think they, they always have an idea that accept means approve. So whenever they, they try to accept the program, they always face a much higher standard. And there are also some minor issues of how to present a program. For example, uh, the program saying that uh, the, the contract saying that the contractor is to provide a statement how to operate the work. And some, some project manager may require a detailed method statement. This, for example, for for for, for, for program last for three years, this is something that impossible for the contractor at the first of about one or two months. For them, all the method statement for the project manager to review. So this is another argument point that sometimes in in, in, in the project manager for accepting a program. Another about the payment and. For the payment, it is particular, um, con I particular concern under the target cost contract is often certain D, often, often certain D, or under also E cost investment contract. And because of the, there is a term called the cost accounting system in presenting the, the, the cost. And so I have come from a cost project. Instead of the payment application to be prepared by QS. They have asked their accountant to prepare the payment application. And I'm not saying that, I mean, the thing that the accountant cannot prepare a, a payment application. But sometimes, uh, in the, um, for example, for the accounting point of view, the, or the definition uh, under the account, accountancy, uh, smile may not, may not be the same as what a consultant professional means. So that there will some, um, I say some mismatch or some misunderstanding about how, how to allocate the different costs, and then it's and then the both the con for a contractor and the project manager need to spend time so that the tie in the, the, the cost information together. And the second one of course about some sensitive cost information. For the contractor side, they are sometimes they are reluctant to provide the. Um, project managers for assessment. But, but even though they know that if they do not provide the same cost information, um, their cost is going to be made free. So that this is some, sometimes consultants will complain about it. And they want to recover the cost. But due to the sake of the baby, the under the company procedure or some, even some, some company, they are still allowed to provide such cost information so that they can pull up and out it. And the following is about the payment for compensation, which is not yet in demand. But argument then follows to the project that to pay or need to or not pay, even though the, the, the event has been or the, the, under the under the under, under this one has been completed. And if and if the port the compensation have not yet in demand. For example, under under option A B, the consultant may get nothing. So then there may be some cash flow issue. So for so sometimes the contractor may may ask the project manager to speed up the assessment of the event so that we can implement as as as, um, as early as possible. But for the option C D and 
it is the, the defect is much, uh, which is much like this, somewhat lesser because they are paid under the five cost. And uh, the Again, then come to the compensation event. The first one is of course about the assessment method. The assessment method of compensation event, which is in the TC system called the variation of, of well, variation of term something, is quite different. For the NEC assessment compensation event, um, apart from an assessment of the work itself, if, if the work has some time implication, you may also need to assess the time effect and the related orientation or disruption incurred. And another concern is about for the contractors, they, some, they sometimes refer to using the field way. But you may think about for, for some options, say for option C, based on our safety disruption, there's no few ways. So that they need to do so that so the contractor need to prepare their assessment. On the first principle, which means that they are thinking about the labor time materials. And even then, after they prepare, they keep the project manager. The project manager may, may, may spend much more time in the set. And the final one is which I think is about the which allowance, which is, which is always an argument between the project manager and the contractor about the extent of the work with allowance 10%, 20%. They always ask about why of 15%, why of 13%, and why do you include such risk allowance? In what basis do you think such allowance, risk allowance will be, will, will be occurred? Lots, lots, lots of argument. And the final one is about the agreement of the compensation event. And the con contract has an idea that they are not required to. To, to carry any words in the combination of their van. If there is no agreement between the project manager and the, and the, and the contractor, because this is incorrect, even though under the TCC contract, once the instruction is provided, the contractor has an obligation to, to complete, the, to carry out the, the instructions. So this is about the, 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 the approach or the misunderstanding that some, some contractor or some automator in using the and in situ that this is the first obstacle. And the obstacle is about the, the approach adopted by project manager or the contractor, regardless of the, what kind of main options they selected. Say under the ECC, there are six options. First two is the price contract and CP is target contract and, and EF cost reversible management etc. Despite they are under the same ECC contract, uh, the attitude of, of, um, of handling the, the, the different options may not be may not be exactly the same. For example, for the subcontracting issues, um, for target contract, um, the, the emphasis on subcontracting should be much more higher than under a price content. Because under the target content, we know that it's under premium share cancel. Which means that the, 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 the price paid for the, con the contractor will have somewhat influence on the final target or the final thinking mechanism to be shared between the main contractor, the contractor and the project manager. So therefore the target Contract and more emphasis should be placed on the acceptance of the subcontractor. But for the price content, because it's always a thing of lump sum or based on the measurement content, whether the subcontractor in the full measure field can complete the work, then I think this is okay. Instead of asking the contractor to provide them all the information, say about the condition of contract, and uh, say about the, the, the some. some uh, pricing involving something, which I think that will not be necessary in the price contract. Then second one, the payment. Uh, for using actual cost, of course, the time required is much, and the resources required is much, hard, is much, is much higher than using a few, option A, option B, because of the field value. And the third one about the every concern about the compensation events. Um, because 
for the field of quantities, you have some field way to follow so that um, if both the quality manager and the competitor are free, they can use the field event of EQ as a basis in assessing the competitive event. But for the activity schedule, there's only an activity state under the, 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 the passing document. So that they look field way and heat. So whenever there is a competition event and um, lots of time and uh, in terms of preparing the quotation and the assessment of the quotation, it is times. And finally, it's about the one choice often. Um, so this is, I think they are about the most important one. If you chose, if you chose the option more, then you may have a big impact on the con on the content. Say for example, if the content um, so long you have to, so long you say target, target content, that which means that you have option C or option B. Because, for example, on, um, then we have some cost saving element under the content. But we all know that uh, for using target content, uh, much more research is required in terms of doing the web present or the access to conversation event, something I know, I know that on the subcontracting acceptance. So you may think that for everyone you, 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 have, you spend lots of resources in, in running a target content, but at the end of the day, they find that they do not have big both parties, the employer and the contractor, and not have, and not have some game share. So that they may think that NEC may not be able to help them. And the final one is of course about there are still some difference between the employer's views and the contractor's views in using NEC. First of all, about the management approach. Of course, and both the employer and the contractor still have freedom. And there is a piling up, there is a piling uh, element under the, the contract. And all the employers will they are willing to, to, to have a collaborative management, so we are working towards a common goal. But for the contractors' view, the first one they think about is not about the collaborative management, it's about their business, how they can maximize their problem. So if the project and at the start, the contractor find that they may lose money, they may not be they may not be eager to have some cooperative management. Instead, they may find ways just to increase or try to recap recap the profit back. And the second one is about the reasons difference. And then you see we know that for for, for everything we remember we check the contractor, they need to provide reasons. But sometimes the contractors use that even though the project manager has provide reason for, 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 for rejection, their reasons are clear. But for the project manager's view, they always said that I have give you a sound reason and a clear reason for reject your, your submission or something. So this is another different policy between the employer's view and the employer's contractor and project manager. And the second one that I mentioned before is about the risk management. Both parties know about the existence of the early warning system under the NEC. And but for the contractor side, they always have a thinking about that. And the the the, the early warning or the risk reduction meeting. And there should be a one party and usually with our contractors required to resolve the problem instead of the employer. Or the project manager. And the third one is about even though they, the, the spirit of early warning or the risk everything is to, to encourage both parties to openly share the, the risk and solution, providing solution to the problems. There's always some hidden agenda because both sides must have, must, um, must have something they do not want to present to the other party. Another one is about the different policy about the program. For the employers view, the 
the central slogan has some has, has a, a concept so significant. But for the contractors view, for a central slogan is only a management tool. They want to they want to have the program retaining the work in according to the program. For the employers view, they want the consider to have the program be updated so that they they can know what the contractor is doing. But the consensus view is that um, they only need to update if it is totally inconsistent with what they are actually having on you, the actual focus of the work. So that there are some conflicting views between the employers and the contractors in dealing with the program issue. And add together with about the, 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 the previous slide saying about the acceptance program and how to present the program. This is a, I would say, this is always a, 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 a different point of view about the, the handling of program. And also about the variation between compensation and event. And for the employers, you know, they, they know that okay, under the NEC, there will be a certain uncertain covering the all the time and cost effect. But for the contractors, you know, they, they prefer to separate the, the Competition in the two issues. One is work related, and for the time and the time related and the time related and the, and the time related cost element, they want to have it to be assessed separately. Because they know that for, for, for assessing of the EOT and program cost and something, it takes time. But for the assessment of the work itself, uh, it may it can be resolved much much quicker. And the second one, of course, the contractor is probably using the few ways. Because they, 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 they run it to spend extra time in preparing the, the time cost and trivial cost. And the final one under the NEC, uh, there is a contractor time bar, which means that they, they are they, uh, contractor need to, need to stick to some time frame of everything they are coming to the event or or the case of commendation event. And there is also a, a default acceptance on under the project manager side. If they do not reply to the con contractors as the application in, 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 in the required time frame. But for the contractors view, they do not think that they are such default acceptance under the contract because whenever the, the time has come, and the project manager may ask the contractor to extend time frame. And the contractor always say that I um, have no choice. If I do not, if I do not accept that, um, I'm afraid that the contractor that the, that the, that the project manager may provide assessment, which is much lower than we expect. And he and the contractor know that once the, the, the commentator event is in Vima or is, if it's in Vima, the contractor can do nothing. Except under the subsequent distribution options. So that even though there is some default acceptance provision under the contract, we consider that the law five that is much useful for them. So if NEC is adopted, what do the parties, the employer, the project manager, and the contractor need to do? If some some items of um, rock has been has been split before and then we lot of lot be repeat here. But the most important about the eight point eight and point nine is to about the so on solve problem solving and the and point nine listen to others, know what they want and how to resolve the problem. And the final one, of course, is to everything to it now. So this is my presentation, and, and let's get very faster in the discussion. Okay, thanks. <coughs> thank you, Charles and Rob for the sharing. And here we are going to uh, into the Q and A session or the panel discussion session. And for those uh, who uh, have questions about what have been presented. You are welcome to enter your questions into the Q&A chat box. 
and the speakers here will try their best to answer your questions. And so, uh, with the further delay, delay, we can see there is uh, the first questions from the Q and A box. Uh, in better communication skills, I believe this is uh, Rob's share. Uh, in building job, it has a coordination meeting for building service and building work. Without RFI verbal confirmation, it will affect the progress. So you want to know how to solve this common issue. Yeah. So uh, get the scope right in the first place, get the design right in the first place, there'll be no RFIs. Uh, verbal confirmation, that is a really problematic area. I can't remember what I said 10 minutes ago. How many of you remember what you said days ago to the exact letter? But then it's just not good practice, that, that's what I would say. So with, with an RFI, how do you know the, the urgency of the importance of the thing in front of you? But I think each, it, these are issues, I'm not saying they don't happen, of course they do. If, if you have an issue that needs resolving, I would prefer that you go through the early warning process, even if you've got five seconds of your time to say, and actually this is, you know, it will have this kind of effect or this time, time, kind of time of cost effect, it will help calibrate our mind. That I see with RFIs, they're abused. So, yeah, sometimes people are lazy, they don't look, they don't look to find the information, it's there, but they're lazy. Half the RFIs don't need to be actually raised. And the other ones come without any explanation as to the criticality of them. So I just think it's poor practice. I, I know that people need answers to questions. I'm just questioning and challenging the current RFI process that it comes without any you know, implications of time, cost or quality issues that affect it. So well, what I'm saying is, they still, they're still there, push them through the early warning process and then go left for a true early warning with real time cost of quality impacts and turn right if you mean RFI and perhaps they can be dealt with quickly by a technical person. But I, I, I think we need to get tender documents right or we'll solve half the problem. The, another half the problem, well, that's two halves, isn't it? Of the remaining half, think before you actually bring an RFI to the table. Do your own research to make sure it genuinely is a request for information. So the existing practice, uh, the RFI may not be necessary or may not be so may not be effective. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it may, may not be necessary to work together to solve it. But we just throw it straight over to the architect or whoever. <laughs> Here, solve this. Yeah. Or solve it with me. Tell me of the importance of it. Tell me, you, know, you two minds better than one. So I just think it's a lazy way throwing the problem back to probably the originator, probably if it is the architect, they caused the problem in the first place, but, but let, let's let's help, let's work with them to solve the problem. Okay, uh, here comes uh, another question. Uh, this, <clears throat> this audience said that I do agree if all parties in the contract cooperate and trust each other well, NEC will be very effective contracts. But the real problem is that how to promote the trust among the parties. Say some of the consultant engineer always thinks that whatever the contractors say must be a lie. <laughs> a very <laughs> poor experience. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe true. Yeah. 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 So the employer may think why the contractor says some suggestions only because he can get more money. So how to change the party's mindset? It, it takes time to it, so I've got this in front of me because I cannot see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. So how do you change the mindset? I mean, if you, what did it say? The consultant engineer always thinks whatever well, contract so must be alive. And that, that's a that's a pretty dim view of life, isn't it? My, my advice to that person, that consultant engineer, is to leave the industry. You know, if you think you are surrounded by liars, you have to leave the industry, you know, because that must be depressing. If I thought everybody around me lied all the time, that would be really depressing, soul destroying. So it can't be true, can it? Um, now, do people always lie? Not in my experience. Do, do they hold back the truth? Yes, that's the frustrating bit. Mm -hmm. So I think the, how close is a lie to holding back the truth? Neither is good. Neither is good. I don't want people lying to me, that would cause a problem. But I also don't want people holding back the, 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 the truth. If we know what the truth is, it will give us a chance of finding a solution to the problem. So learn to be ethical. 
uh, understand understand your ethical obligations. You got chartered, whether you're through HKIS or whatever. You've sworn an oath that allegiance to to act ethically. And one of the the, the main aspects of eth ethical acting is to be honest. So again, if you don't want to be honest, go and go to another industry. Get, leave our industry. We surely want you know, hardworking, intelligent nice honorable honest speaking people so so i think it, it's uh, it's an individual thing look in the mirror if if, if you are a habitual liar then you, know, you have problems in life let alone the construction industry the workplace expects you to tell the truth you know whoever these contractors are that that person says they lie look on that contractors website they will say we have honorable people who are ethical and tell the truth so so let's call it out that you know um, trust, I think, comes over time. So, do we trust each other when we first met? I don't think so. I don't think you can automatically trust somebody. But if we just keep telling the truth, having an opinion over time, we, our trust levels will emerge. So, I'm not expecting trust to happen like that. But I do expect us to be you know, honourable, honest, and professional. And, and that will build the trust levels. And that's what we want, isn't it? Ultimately, go back to the first question with the RFI, I want to be able to say, by when do you need this information? Genuinely, most people say oh, Friday, but they really mean Friday after. Tell the truth, you know. And would it be a problem if it was the Friday after that? Well, not really, but you know, just, just tell the truth. Yeah. So, so the trust do not develop overnight. Yeah. Yeah. It takes time. It takes time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's what we have to do is to perform ourselves uh, in a professional way, in a, in an ethical way. So that's what I say. So have something mm -hmm. about. You. You know, I can't, I'm not sitting very straight. <laughs> yeah. Sit up straight, put your back up. You know, have something about you, that inner strength, you know, professionalism. Tell, tell the truth. Be professional pride. All those things that you were saying earlier. Yeah. You know, be proud to be chartered, and, and that comes with responsibility. And one of those things is to act honestly. Okay. Here comes our next question. Could the early warning two general items be delayed in later reports or register? <laughs> What's that question? Mean? <laughs> yeah. Because some, some, sometimes they, they give an early warning. This is, I think that both parties cannot be mitigated or even without to be solved. Say for some one example, I've given before is, let's just say that a, a risk is about the change of the environment and change of substance, which is too general. And even though this is a risk, you cannot mitigate because under the construction contract, there's always a change of the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So that so that at the end of the day, when they just put in keywords, keep in view. Yeah. I, th I think I think one of the problems with we have with programs, early warnings and conversations right now mm -hmm. is the starting point is poor, you know, in NC4 scope. Mm -hmm. Scope is not written well enough. Mm -hmm. So the reason we have too many problems with the program with conversations, too many early warnings, is because of the poor starting point. So it is about slowing up that little bit and improving you know the high quality of tender documents that we should aspire to produce for our clients we owe our clients the duty of you know high professionalism we charge quite a lot of money so we should have you know pretty amazing tender documents that we are professionally proud of if we can sort that out i think you will see better programs more sensible prices less conversation events less early warnings um, you, you can, I have seen it where the, the scope is effectively doubled and that's all, oh, the NEC doesn't work very well, but actually the starting point was so bad that the NEC machinery cannot cope with five early warnings a day, five instructions a day, five conversation events a day. You, you, will just, you will just blow the machinery. Yeah. Okay, the next question is about and your view on NEC, because there are uh, quite a lot of difference between the use of GCC and NEC4, which the, uh, the audience asked about is uh, whether the employer and the contractor should be aware of what kind of difference that you would like to highlight to them. Uh, what the significant difference between GCC and NEC4? <clears throat> I, think, I think the two main, the two processes I would highlight in terms of contract management are the program and the early warning process, neither of which, frankly, feature in GCC. I don't think the drafters believe in the program, the benefits of the program. 
And when I first started in the industry using contracts equivalent to GCC, the first time I saw a program was after the job was finished, when it was used as a claims device. So I don't think the drafters have any belief in the contractor's program. Go back to the earlier one about the contractors always like, you know, we, we, there's mischief in contractors programs. Go back 30 years ago, maybe it's mischief in contractors programs. But come on, I think, I think what's done is done. Let, let's look forward. Let's realize the benefit of a really good program. Now they're not perfect programs, but they should be the best and honest intentions of the contractor. So let's help the contractor produce great programs. Mm -hmm. Particularly in the public sector, they're spending our money. Our, mm -hmm. The taxes that we pay go into government, go back into the public sector. Mm -hmm. Contract, everybody's spending taxpayers' money, so we need to spend that wisely. Not quite every dollar counts, but let's let's spend that those tax dollars wisely. So I think the, the two standout processes that me that are so different to GCC are the program and the early warning process. How about it's right? On the event, I'm going to focus on the founder how to, uh, what's the different difference between the GCC and NDC4. For instance, I also want to point out is to about how to interpret NDC and NDC and NDC. You must first of all, NDC4, you must know how the purpose of every course in the contract. Say for example, the early warning, what's the purpose? Why do we, why do the early warning need to bring the content? Okay, this is necessary. So after you have learned more about purpose of the intention of encoding and subsequent the content, and you can use it effectively well. instead of, instead of you know, using it just for voice, say for example, if I do not use the early warning, if it finally comes to common season event, my assessment with panels will not have such a say illusion. You know, first of all, you know about the purpose of the causes, why they include the content, the purpose. Okay. okay, thanks. And next questions. Next question. It is suggested that NEC, in terms of subcontracting program and payment, may consume more time and resources than the traditional form of contract like GCC. So, what is your opinion on this? Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fact. Good. <laughs> this is a fact. Good. We need to spend more time yeah. on the program. What, what, what were they? We need to spend more time on subcontracting to make sure that the contractor set up subcontract properly. We need to spend more time on the program thinking more in that future. We need to spend more time on payment, making sure the right amount of money is paid to the contractor as quickly as possible. So good, I say, yeah. that we spend more time on these things. I want to spend less time on doing things that don't add value. They, I think these are basically value-adding processes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we need to think about is, where's the, where's the non value add processes and what can we do about those? You say easy, yes, you need to spend extra time in terms of program payment, something. But just as Robert said before, this is useful. Yeah. Because even the process of how the, the, the negotiation or or in the program, say for example, program sample or according to program content, the, the, they can have a more cooperative spirit built between them. Mm. So I so I agree with Robert that yes, it you have you will consume more time. Mm. But this is useful, yeah. helpful. So at the end of the day, you can save some money and good, time. Good, good for all businesses. Yes. This is not just about the clients or the contractors, it's about every business associated with the project. Mm -hmm. Every business wants a greater degree of certainty. Mm -hmm. what, how much will we get paid? How much will we spend? What will it look like? Mm -hmm. Are our staff in danger, you know, health and safety wise? Mm -hmm. You know, what, when is it programmed to finish? What will it look like? Mm -hmm. How can we get a pat on the back? You know, mm -hmm. how can we get a reasonable profit? How can we get a reasonable cash flow? Well, why can't all all the businesses associated with the construction project mm -hmm. get a better outcome than what they do currently? And that's what we should do. We should focus on what we each want out of a project. What do you want? What do you want? This is what I want. Let's try and achieve each other's objectives, help each other achieve those objectives. So of course we client focus. If there weren't clients, we wouldn't have an industry, would we? <laughs> so primarily we are client focused, but we, we also have to look at the entire industry that is giving the you know serving the needs of the clients. 
and recognise that, you know, and individually, you need to work reasonable working hours, not crazy hours. We need to protect people from bullying, from, you know, harassment, from workplace problems, from stress, you know, mental health issues, all these things. We, I think we have a responsi responsibility to make sure that we protect our workforce, our entire workforce, as best as we can. And nobody's subjected to you know, any, any problems. How do we do that? I think, the, I, I think it's quite exciting. You know, I think the focus in the past has been wrong. I think the focus in the future will be much better directed on getting the best out of people. Because if we don't, we'll all be replaced by artificial intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, we really need a change in mindset. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, this is the time to uh, go to the next questions. He said that the main contractor seems to be the one who is directly affected by switching the contract from GCC to NEC4. Uh, is there any implications to the subcontractors which they should pay attention to? Now? I'm not sure the main contractor is directly affected or, or the one who's most directly affected. I think I think we're all affected. We all have to have a different attitude and mindset. So uh, I think I think we're all affected to a degree, but I think the focus is on those processes which which truly add value, you know, do more of the right things, which I said earlier. And now the problem I have found, I found this in the UK some time ago, is I remember when we first had sort of partnering workshops. The partnering only went as far as the main contractor. And therefore, the people who are really doing the work of the customers, why is we cut out of it? And that's wrong. So we have to bring you know, everybody along on this journey. There's a journey to revolutionize the industry, to have a really world class industry. Yeah, my aspirations for Hong Kong is to try and be the best construction industry in the world. Is it? I don't know. Does anybody, you know, who's better than Hong Kong? Who does more amazing things than? Infrastructure buildings out there. What, why can't Hong Kong be part of the best construction industry in the world, whatever that means? Sure, it's always going to be one of the most expensive because the land costs, but you know, <laughs> we, we can be the best here, can't we? We can be the best at everything else. There's no, I don't think there's any obstacle stopping us being the best industry in the world, but just have to be one of the most expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we can look at the next questions. You can approve in views of attitude in assessing program in the presentation sign number 24. I mean, this, this presentation should refer to HY's presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And it mentioned that uh, uh, the synthesis only accept or not accept the program in NEC. What is right. the difference between the approve and accept from a contextual point of view? Yeah. Yes, I'm question them. Yes, under the NEC, there is no, no such terms as approved. Something they only has a set. And the purpose of including same day access is just to say that uh, for every program set by the project manager, it does not mean that the contractor's liabilities, which are always responsibility, will be reduced. So, but, but take the program example, um, even though the, the project manager is only owes only to a set of program, they always take time because um, this is mainly because of our, of our, of our main uh, because uh, under the under a, a contract if we are using the OTCC when we transform it to NEC4 just to understand the GCC say for example it's just a specific example they are most of words you would call approved and we will always use a how to call a terminology to say that approved means accepted so they always give the project manager a, a misunderstanding that the proof and accept is tied up. But in fact, under NZ for contract, there's no approval. They only really accept the responsibility still under the contract. So, 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 so this is the difference between the proof and the accept on the contract form. Yeah. Well, um, well, acceptance comes with a, an explanation. If you accept something, then it does not change the contractor's responsibility to provide the works or their liability for their uh, design, if they are the designers. Approval, what does that mean? I don't know. Ask a lawyer. <laughs> well, it's a, I think it's a dangerous word. So you, you possibly can attract some liability as a result of approving something, but can't give legal advice. So don't use that word. Use the word accept. It comes with an explanation. Mm -hmm. However, 
when you're accepting design or not accepting design, you still have a professional duty to look over it. Don't just say, oh, well, I'll just accept everything because if it's wrong, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So you still have a professional duty to discharge. So look at the things in front of you and accept them if you believe they are, that they're okay. If they're not okay, do not accept it. The only, the only thing I would say is if you're about to say, I do not accept your design or your program, Talk to the contractor first and maybe they'll say, oh, I missed that one, thank you. Let me change it, give me two minutes and here's a revised one. Try, try and say yes, but don't compromise your professionalism in that pursuit of the word yes. Mm -hmm. I can see there are still couples of questions, but I know that we are running out of time. Yes. But well, any, any other questions? So, so remember, if we miss any questions out, we will answer them uh, next week and send them back. Yes, yes, That's we will still on. consolidate the questions and answer by the two speakers. And yeah. Oh, moment. okay, That's us done then. Yes. So, yes. Is that <laughs> Another important part uh, for, <laughs> for the participants, please uh, scan this QR code for an evaluation survey because uh, we need your feedback uh, to us. Yes. And I'm sure tonight uh, we have heard about quite a lot about the benefit and obstacles of the and confusing the NEC contracts. And thank you both for your sharing. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I know that this is the last session uh, of uh, NEC training, uh, NEC series, which has been organized by, by, uh, by NEC and CIC. So uh, also, thanks for your support all along. Yes. And also, thanks for everyone who could support uh, organizing this seminar tonight. So, Good evening and see you all. Yeah. Well